So have you ever found yourself in a situation where you want to learn how to play something on the banjo and you've got it kind of figured out and you can kind of play it, but that's about it. You can't really play it, you can't play it up to speed, and no matter what you do, you just can't get there. Well, I think we've all been there before, and that's where I was recently when I was trying to learn that excerpt from a new tune by Bela Fleck called Vertigo from his upcoming album, My Bluegrass Heart, something I'm really excited for and which has kind of been taking the banjo world by storm on social media lately. And that's actually what I wanna talk about today. To be clear, this is not a lesson on the tune Vertigo. I'm just gonna use this intro as an example. This lesson is really for anyone. I know there are a lot of people out there that are just starting on the banjo, or maybe even playing for a couple years, but either way, you've probably come up against this problem, trying to learn something that you can't quite get right. So some of these tips might be new information for you, or maybe it's stuff that you already know, but you just need a reminder. But either way, let's talk today about ways to practice difficult music on the banjo. Now, if you're not ready to learn this material yet, that's totally fine. But just for context, here's a slowed down version of this melody. In the intro, it starts out slowly and gradually speeds up, but it's also the B part of the tune itself that's played later all at one tempo. So here is slow down all at one tempo, that melody. So depending on your level of experience, maybe that seems really daunting and challenging or maybe not such a big deal, but you can also just substitute in your mind whatever difficult thing you're working on at the moment because all these concepts are gonna work just the same. And when it comes to these concepts, in my mind, I kind of have a hierarchy of things that are most important or things that apply to all the different practice techniques that I'll use. And I like to start with those and make sure I'm always applying those principles so that I'm always keeping track of the things that I think are important. One of which is something that I need to remind myself of all the time, but it makes a world of difference. And that's making sure that I'm playing without tension. This doesn't have to do with this particular piece or any piece in general, but playing music is so much easier when you avoid tension in your muscles, in your hands or your arms, or your back, or wherever it comes up, because it can come up anywhere, even if it's not really helping you play. So when I'm struggling to play something, one of the first things I'll check in with is whether or not I'm holding tension in any part of my body that might be hindering my ability to play that thing. When you think about it, when your muscles are tense, especially in your hands, it's a lot harder for you to move your fingers, for instance. And that's not the only place that tension comes up. It can come up anywhere, and that always has some kind of impact. And this is not an easy thing to deal with, but it's pretty important. So if I'm trying to play something, especially something really fast, then I need to make sure that I can move everything freely and tension gets in the way of that. So from this point on, every tip that I give you will hopefully have that applied to it, that you're releasing tension and allowing yourself to play more freely. The other aspect of technique that I like to think about has to do with the choices that I'm making with the way that I play things, specifically the fingerings that I use. I don't wanna be using a different fingering every time I play something because I'm never gonna build experience with a particular way of playing something. Before I really start practicing something, I kinda of wanna decide how I'm gonna play something, which fingers I'm using, so that I can actually build experience playing things in a certain way. The more experience I have, the better I am at it. But if I'm doing it differently every time, then I have a very small amount of experience with a lot of different things. So before I get too deep into anything that I'm practicing, I just try to make sure that I'm playing things in the most efficient way that I possibly can. And there isn't necessarily just one way to do that. And this is pretty obvious if you watch other banjo players. They don't tend to play the same licks and tunes identically to each other, but within their own playing, they tend to play the same licks and tunes the same way. It doesn't necessarily mean you're always playing the same notes, but when you're in a certain position, you tend to have certain ways of playing certain shapes. And one thing that can happen is that when you practice things slowly, you can get away with some pretty inefficient fingerings and positions, but when you speed it up, you find that those aren't going to work. So you might have to try a couple different options and sometimes guess what's gonna work at higher speeds. And you can totally check out videos of other banjo players to get inspiration on different fingerings or positions to find out what might be the best way for you to play something. But assuming that you've figured all of that out, you know how you wanna play something, you've got the general idea, you just can't quite execute it up to speed yet, we have to get into some other techniques that will actually help you play things better. And the first of those, perhaps the most obvious, definitely the one that I talk about the most is playing slowly 
with a metronome. When you're trying to play something really challenging, what you're looking for is consistency and predictability. You wanna be able to produce something over and over again to a similar level of quality. And there's nothing more consistent and predictable than a metronome. But beyond that, it's just a really great way to keep yourself focused and control your progress in a gradual way. And there are a lot of different ways to do this, but if you wanna keep it simple, which is probably a good idea in the beginning, then you can just set your metronome to click every time you play an eighth note, which in this example is every note. So for instance, this is my Time Guru app. It's just one of the apps that I like, and I'll set it to, for instance, 200 beats per minute. Then I'll just play along with that. And if I can do that at 200 beats per minute, playing all the notes the way that I mean to, in time, I'm staying relaxed, then I can probably do that at 205 beats per minute. And if I can do that, I can probably do it at 210 beats per minute, gradually increasing speed, getting a little bit better, but being really careful that I'm playing everything the way that I mean to. And when you do it gradually like that, you can really keep track of how your body feels and how things sound. You can sense if there's a little bit of tension creeping in in your hand, or maybe if you're having a hard time keeping up. But if you do it gradually like that, then you'll be able to make choices and say, okay, that's my limit, or I can go a little faster, or maybe I should do it a little slower to make sure that I actually have it. And for what it's worth, progress can look like a lot of different things. It's not always just playing something faster. Sometimes it's just realizing that you're playing with tension and then letting go of that tension. Sometimes it's realizing that there's a better fingering that you can use that's actually making it a little easier to play. That's also progress. Anything that in the long run helps you get to your goal is progress, even if it feels like a step back. For instance, playing slower, if that's that's what you need to do to make sure you get things right, make it sound the way you want it to, is actually progress. It's way better than trying to play faster than you can and having it not really sound the way you want. So that in itself is one of the best things you can do to learn something. And the reason I brought it up early on is because like playing without tension, like choosing fingerings beforehand, it's something you can apply to all the other things that you're doing while you're practicing but it's not the only thing you can do. One big part of practicing is just figuring out what's challenging about what it is that you're playing so you can pinpoint different things about it. We're not trying necessarily just to practice the whole entire tune or the whole entire intro or whatever it is. There are gonna be specific things that need to be targeted and we can target them in different ways. I mean, think about anything you've learned on the banjo so far. Some tunes are easier than others. Some parts of tunes are also easier than others. So one thing that you can do is break things into pieces and look at the structure of what it is that you're trying to learn and see if some parts need more practice or see if some parts need a different type of practice. So just looking at this passage from Vertigo, you might not have immediately noticed it, but there are actually five distinct sections, some of which that repeat, some of which don't. So what are these sections? Well, the first section sounds like this. I'll call it section A. Then there's section B. Then there's something that I'll call section C. Then we repeat section A, repeat section B. Then there's something that sounds kind of like section C, but it's a little different, so we could call it C2 or something like that. Then we repeat section A again, repeat section B again. Then again, there's a section kind of like section C, but again, with a different variation, so we could call that C3. So as you can see with some of these different sections or phrases, some repeat, some don't, some are longer, some are shorter, some are easier and some are more difficult. So they're gonna require a little bit of a different approach. So one option is that you could learn each part individually. So you can give it your full attention and really learn it before moving on to the next section. It's totally fine to just loop one section. And one benefit of this is that you don't necessarily have to play through the whole thing just to get to the section that actually needs your attention. Because chances are section A isn't gonna give you nearly as much trouble as section C3 and so on. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that if you're breaking things apart to practice them individually, then eventually you wanna put them back together again. And when you do that, you wanna make sure you're actually putting them back together again. One of the worst things you can do is end up with this.
playing things at different speeds, gaps between sections, you don't want any of that. So that in itself could be something to practice. It's really just about prioritizing the details and working on the things that are challenging. And if putting them together is challenging, well, that's the part you practice. Now, let's say you've done all that. You've learned all the pieces. You've put it back together. You can actually play through the whole thing at a slow speed. But even if you try to go gradually faster and faster, you still run into problems. It gets much harder the faster you get. Well, one thing with all of this is that it does take time. And we'll talk more about that later. But it's not just physical, it's also mental. It has to do with the way that you're thinking about things, what you're looking at on the fretboard. Especially in a passage like this, when you're actually supposed to be playing pretty fast and getting across the fretboard pretty quickly. Just making sure you're landing in the right place is a challenge enough. So, you have to be really, really familiar with what it is that you're playing, both the sound of it, so you have to listen to it over and over and over again, but you also have to be really familiar with where your hands are supposed to go, not just remembering how one section goes and then starting the next section. It's almost about visualizing what's gonna happen next. For instance, when I'm playing that last section, which I called C3, I have to move from this position all the way up to here in a pretty short amount of... For instance, when I'm playing that last section, which I called C3, I have to move from this position all the way up to this position in a relatively short period of time. And if I'm really familiar with that material, then the biggest challenge is just probably the physicality of moving it from here to here. But it's actually not hard to move your hands back and forth. Anyone can do that. You just have to be more precise about it. You have to actually know what you're supposed to be doing. So one thing that I find that helps is if I have my hands in the right position, I don't have to be looking at my hands. Sometimes it's more helpful to look at where my hands are supposed to be. Because at the end of the day, I can't keep track of everything that I'm doing. I can't look at my left hand and my right hand at the same time. So if I can get really familiar with this material, then I don't have to look at either of those hands, and I actually can spot where I'm supposed to be next, and then my hand goes there a little easier. So unlike the other sections where I can kind of just look generally in the same area and know where I'm at, when I get here, I get my hand in the right position and I play, and then I look where I'm supposed to be. Same thing when I go back down, I'm already in this position. I don't need to look here to see where my hand's supposed to be because it's already there. I can look down here for where I'm supposed to go next. And the only way you can really do that is if you really, really know the material, both physically, but also in your ears. It's very possible, and this is so frequently true, that people are trying to learn things that they don't really hear yet because they haven't heard it frequently enough or because it's not something that they're really familiar with in terms of the sound. Especially with a lick like this, it doesn't really sound like fiddle tunes or more traditional bluegrass. This might take a couple listens to really get in your ear what's supposed to be happening. Think about a song that you really know well or something like Happy Birthday. You would never question what's supposed to happen next and you don't even think about what's supposed to happen next. You just do it. You either play the tune or you sing Happy Birthday. But either way, we're trying to get to the point where we're familiar enough that we don't have to laser focus on exactly what we're doing at that moment and we can plan ahead a little bit. Ideally, in the long run, there's nothing really to look ahead to because you just know something well enough that you're not really thinking about it. In fact, to play this up to speed, it would be really hard to be thinking about anything because it's moving by so quickly. But all of that kind of leads to the final thing that I'm usually thinking about in terms of practicing that really keeps me on track. And that's that it's really hard to predict how long it's gonna take for you to learn something and it's really unreasonable for you to expect yourself to already know how to do something. So even though there are more and less efficient ways of working on things, at the end of the day, it's really more about, do you still wanna learn how to do this? Well, then you should still be working on it. The timeline of progress is really unpredictable and it's different for everyone. I've been playing banjo for almost 10 years now and I have an okay idea of how long certain things are gonna to take to learn, but even then it's not always the same. I also know people who have way less experience than me who learn things way faster. I also know people with way more experience than me that learn things way slower. But once I get into that type of thinking, trying to measure up to other players or my own expectations, I've kind of already missed the point of why it is that I was trying to learn something in the first place. I think the idea is that if I'm not learning something fast enough, then it's not a good enough use of my time. I'm putting in more time than it's worth just to learn this, Right? And even though sometimes I might feel like that, that's really not why I play music or why I picked up the banjo in the first place. I didn't make a calculated risk that it was a good investment of my time. I heard J.D. Crow and I said, I need to learn how to do that. And beyond that, there's so many people that I've met playing this instrument, the community that's fostered by playing music with other people, teaching and learning from other people. It's a really amazing thing. So if I reduce that to my own personal progress on some complicated Bela tune, then that's really kind of sad because there's so much more fun things to do out there in the world of music, like 
continuing to make progress on a really cool Bela tune. So yes, things might take longer than you'd like them to. That's frequently the case for me. I want the things that I want right now, and usually it takes a little bit longer than that. If you succumb to that way of thinking, then your progress is absolutely dead in the water. Even if you were making slow progress before, now it's gone, there's nothing. So yeah, it sounds silly that this would be so serious, but this is the kind of stuff that makes people stop practicing, stop learning, stop making progress, and then they never learn things that they wanted to learn in the first place. So if you can keep in mind what it is that got you started in the first place, why you love the banjo, why you love music, then you can get started again. Now, I'm sure there are plenty of other really cool ways to practice things. I'd love to hear about them, so let me know in the comments below. But that's gonna do it for this video. There's no Patreon content. I just wanted to share some ideas that I had and show you this cool thing from this cool new Bluegrass album coming from Bela Fleck that you should definitely check out. But if you don't mind, do me a huge favor and subscribe to this channel and like this video. That's a huge thing that you can do to help me make more of these videos. So if you do that, I really appreciate it. Anyway, that's gonna do it for this video. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.